couple of guests. Barry Chaikin is with us. Uh, Dr. Jorge Castillo is with us as well. This is always the hard part for me, Barry, okay? Uh, Waldenstrom's macroglobulonemia lymphoma. How close was I? You did a really great job. Because it's hard. Yeah, it is hard. Uh, tell me about it and, and what you found out about it. Okay, so about a year ago, I went to go do a regular physical exam, and I had an elevated protein level in my blood. Um, we worked that up, and it turns out that I had an elevated level of IgM, which is a special type of antibody. And it was extremely high, about 5,500. Normal is about 250, and 170 to 250. Um, it can cause uh, no symptoms at all until it gets really, really high. Sometimes it presents with neuropathies and other types of, of difficulties. My condition was I it was anemic, and I just thought, okay, I'm getting old. I'm not exercising enough. Maybe that's what the problem was. Uh, but it turned out that I had Walgreens symptoms. Uh, Dr. Castillo, uh, how unusual is the type of malady that, that Barry was dealing with? I mean, it's a, it's a rare condition. Uh, blood cancers, per general terms, are a little bit more rare than solid cancers, and that, that's why having you know, a very keen interest on it is, 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 in, is very important. So I would say, based on recent data, about 30,000 patients, 35,000 patients in the country have this condition. So it's a, it's a rare condition. Well, it's unusual that I'd be sitting here for multiple reasons, but in this case, um, 2010, I have a nephew who's at that time in his late 20s, uh, maybe early 30s, and, and he went to Michigan State, and a uh, very healthy, you know, he was a really strong, strong young man. And uh, I thought he started to look a little, he didn't look great to me. He came up for one of my daughter's weddings and, and uh, he was losing a little weight, I thought, and he just didn't look, you know. And within a few months, he was diagnosed with Waldenstrom's. I don't know the specific, you know, gene or, or, or strain of, of what, you know, which, which is which, because they are hard to pronounce and yeah. they did a very fine job there. But when you say, so one in 30,000, I had never heard of it. And I know that uh, he came to the, the Dana-Farber and got his treatment protocol here and was carried out in Michigan. And, and he's, he's able to live, live a, a nice life and, and uh, would present as doing great to everybody. But this is something, my understanding, it, it doesn't go away for him. It's just a condition. Is it a condition that one lives with ongoing? Yeah, I mean, uh, as of today, you know, we, we always say that, you know, we don't have a cure yet mm -hmm. for this condition. I think uh, the laboratory and the clinical group at Dana-Farber are working in other places in the country and the world are working very hard on trying to find a cure for this condition. But as of today, we don't have a cure for Waldenstrom's. So it is one of these chronic conditions that people live with. So we observe patients, they do become symptomatic, we treat them, we send the, the disease into some type of remission that sometimes lasts for years. The disease comes back, we treat it again, you know. Uh, fortunately, over the, my 10 year, ten, you know, tenure at Dana-Farber, we have seen major advances in, in the treatment of these conditions to the point that most patients at this time with Waldenstrom's don't die of Waldenstrom's anymore, you know, and I think that is a, a very important outcome. From, from our perspective, trying to improve patients' lives. Is it a disease that there, there's more of the disease now, or is there just more awareness of it? Because I had never heard of it yeah. 15 Actually, years Actually, uh, you know, many doctors don't see one patient with Waldenstrom's in their lifetimes, you know? Right. And if you go and talk to different colleagues who practice either, you know, blood cancers, and they, they see a, a handful of patients in their whole careers. So we get to see anywhere between 12 and 18 patients in one day at Dana-Farber. So have that degree of expertise it's really, you know, something that we don't see, you know, someplace else. I don't think there's more Waldenstrom's coming out. I think the, the, the number of patients uh, is the same throughout the years. But now the patients are living longer. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that increases the number of patients overall in the country. And obviously, you know, if you build it, they will come, right? So Dr. Steven Trion created the uh, form, the Bing Center for Waldenstrom's at Dana-Farber about 20 years ago. I came about 10 years ago and I became the clinical director of the program. So we have a very strong laboratory foundation. We have a very strong clinical trial group. And basically, we kind of feed on each other, right? So the science comes out from the lab, gets into the clinic. The clinic collects the samples from patients, goes back into the lab. And then we continue that you know, feedback cycle to try to improve the treatments over time. Very interestingly enough, you're the chief technology officer for healthcare at Pegasystems. You're also a published author. Uh, you wrote a book on healthcare information technology. Did any of that prepare you for a personal experience with this? 
Well, having gone to medical school, even though I'm a preventive medicine public health doctor and not an oncologist, the ability for me to understand what Dr. Castillo, Dr. Sorosek, and others spoke to me about the disease helped me get through it because I understood what they were trying to do. I understood what the drugs would actually do. When I entered the clinical trial, I had a really good idea what the risks were associated with it. So I was very fortunate to be able to understand that. And I have to tell you, if anybody has someone, a family member who has cancer, they have cancer, it's really important for them to look to someone who can explain to them what all the words mean, what the journey might be like. And I want to emphasize also that when I started medical school, cancer was a disease that killed people. All these years later, because of the work that Dr. Sorosek has done, Dr. Castillo has done, all the wonderful people that Dana-Farber have done, it's now becoming a chronic disease. 20 years ago, I'd probably die from Waldron's Dumps. Now, I'm probably going to live a lot longer and probably pass away from something else, right? And that gives me a lot of hope, and I encourage all people who have cancer to think of it that way, that this isn't something that is going to lead to their demise. It's just another chronic disease that we have many, many treatments for that people can live a long, long time with. We use the phrase cure cancer probably too much in our lives. Uh, curing cancer may not be what we're talking about in your particular instance, but what we are talking about is giving you a longer, healthier life. Exactly. We don't cure old age. We don't cure um, congestive heart failure, right? We don't cure high blood pressure. We live with it, we treat it, we extend people's lives, we improve their activities of daily living, we improve the ability for them to be social, to be with their family, to see their children and their grandchildren and even their great-grandchildren. So cancer isn't something that is an end. It's just one other thing, one other bump in the road in your life that you go over with your bicycle or with your car or you walk over and you deal with the same way you deal with hypertension or any other diseases. I'm not playing down that in some cases cancers can be quite brutal, quite aggressive, quite painful for the patient and their family. But in many, many cases today, unlike 10, 20, 30 years ago, it is that chronic disease that we will be able to live with. Barry Chaikin, congratulations on how things have gone for you so far. You know, one more for Barry, because I'm looking at the, the crib notes they gave us here for Barry. It says here, he is a big fan of baseball and loves the Red Sox and the New York Mets. That is not possible. So, no, i got to ask That's you, not possible. What did you do in the 86 World <laughs> Series? That's a place to be. <laughs> There's a famous saying that comes out of the Middle East that says, the enemy yeah. of your enemy is your friend. Okay. When I was four years old, I learned to dislike the evil empire. So when I moved to Boston, it was very easy for me to become a season ticket holder for the Red Sox since 1988, and I'm proud of it. And any time the Yankees lose, it's a good day for me. What did you do during the 86 World Series? I sat on my couch. <laughs> Who did you root for? <laughs> to be continued. See? <laughs> giving it up. Barry, great to see you. Thanks, Thanks so, much. so much, Dr. Castillo. Luck. Thank you very my much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Guys, continue.